It is with a heavy heart that I feel need to write this today, but for my kids' sake, I need to do everything I can for myself and ultimately for them. My ex-wife has gone out of her way to make the last three years of my life nearly torture. I have been a victim of deprivation of parental rights, financial loss, defamation of character, abuse, and more importantly, my children have had to witness and endure themselves physical and emotional abuse. I believe that my ex-wife no longer understands how to be a parent. I believe that she does not realize what she is currently taking away and has taken away from me and also my children. Until this day, I do not understand why she felt that complete annihilation from her family was a good plan. She first had to destroy me, the father of the children, while not respecting that she is destroying them as well in the process. My children on countless nights cried, afraid their father would be arrested in front of their eyes, or that they would not see me for long periods of time again and again. My son and my daughter have had to go through physical and mental abuse over and over. My son and daughter have been physically assaulted by my ex, their own mother, and on one account, each seen at the local emergency department of South Huron for the severity of the pain and the bruising. The Children's Aid Society of Huron County has confirmed these issues and have given documentation to this. The Children's Aid Society has assured me that my ex was given a stern warning and that this behavior that she called physical discipline was unacceptable and could not and cannot happen again moving forward. But unfortunately, after that date, my children have been victim to further physical and mental abuse. My son and daughter have both been locked in their rooms, unable to use simple necessities such as a washroom. This ultimately leading them to urinate in their bedroom vents and their dresser drawers. The Huron County Children's Aid Society once again verifying these issues and telling my ex she needed to flip the doorknobs around properly to ensure the kids would not be trapped or abandoned. The thought is their father knowing this is happening, not being able to help, as I know my ex will again have me arrested on false accusations, and in my mind, knowing she will be given just a simple warning from either the Children's Aid Society or the OPP. The long-term effects of all these things that my ex inflicted on my children will not only take them years, but possibly a lifetime to comprehend the trauma and the pain that my ex inflicted upon them. While I have been following the instructions of the Children's Aid Society and the courts, my ex has been creating an environment of paranoia and fear in my children and in myself. My ex has gone through great lengths to convince the children and the world that I am a monster. Our children should have been and should be focused on school, sports, friends, and growing up like a normal child should be. But the time has been spent using my children to aid their malicious intentions and watching their mother destroy their father. My worry for my children is that they will not understand why their mother would not and did not want them to have the love and support of both parents. You have stolen almost three years now from the children and myself that they cannot get back and that I cannot get back. There are times where full months at a time I would not see my children and they would not see me. Despite the court order already set out by Justice McDonald, the OPP trying over and over where you would refuse and not follow that order. The OPP told my ex the importance of following the order and how this will affect the kids and you would still not listen. My ex knows that seeing my children is the most important part of my week and has made countless remarks about how she can and will take away starting with my Wednesdays, which you will see my ex is trying in these next court proceedings. Pardon? I can't make that decision, buddy. You gotta ask mom if you can stay. I'm gonna leave this here, though, okay? I'm back for mommy. You're back already? What? I only got to go for nothing. I already told you, if you want to stay with dad, you gotta ask your mom, okay? Daddy! I know. Give me a hug. You gotta keep me warm. I'm turning into a snowman out here. Yeah. You ever seen uh, uh, Santa Claus 3 where the guy's an Iceman? No. Oh. I haven't seen the Iceman. I've seen the Iceman. Alright, let's see if she's out there. 
Honey, jump, jump. Oh my goodness. My children now live with a man that my ex is dating who has inflicted mental abuse upon my kids and even had his own daughter at the age of seven who was removed from his care in the same home for physically assaulting her. On one occasion, I had to watch my children jump from my ex's boyfriend's moving vehicle as he told my kids when my friend, the third party, shut the car door at a drop-off that if they do not listen to him, he would call the police and have me arrested. My heart sank seeing this, again feeling helpless and angry that I cannot protect my children. This too showed me that in the minds of my ex and her boyfriend that they use the justice system as a malicious tool, a crutch, to only hurt me and further damage my relationship with my children and in my finances. You have a good week, okay? And look at me. On Wednesday, I'll be right here, okay? Hey, listen, okay? You be good. Promise? Okay, I'm gonna watch. You yell at me when you get up there, okay? Hey, don't slip. I know. Hey, hey, get up there. I'm freezing. Hey, when you get up there, let me know you're up there, okay? I love you, buddy. Some of the most gut-wrenching moments that I can recall is hearing that my kids were getting through the windows of their mother's house to run away and to try to find me, not being notified of this immediately or even at all. Seeing the bruises left from my ex on their arms and their necks. Or like mentioned that they were being trapped in their rooms beyond any time out or any need to even be put in there, having to urinate in their bedroom drawers and their vents. My ex admitted that they were only in their rooms when a male would come over, but they would give them donuts from that male, that they should have banged louder if they had to pee. The trauma this has caused them is something they will again live with for the rest of their lives. I am sure never fully understanding why this has happened to them, as I can't explain it properly even when they ask me why. Financially, this has caused me near bankruptcy and continues to deplete my funds that I need to, to get by with only essentials and no extras. For any finances to pay off previous debts that was left in our marriage and now fall on my shoulders. My ex tried last year having me charged with roughly 10 plus charges that I had to work diligently and thoroughly through to clear my name of any wrongdoing. I have had to step back as an outreach director currently at my church, Vital Point, as I did not want a bad image of my, of what my ex has accused me of projected on my church. Over and over, you have hurt me financially and emotionally. I want and need this to stop for my health, for my finances, but also for my children to grow up and have a healthy relationship with both of their parents. I would ask and I hope that the courts please would look at the evidence I have proven and provided and that my two beautiful children finally be able to live a healthy and wholesome life in my care. I have multiple witnesses to the things described above of the ongoing issues that my kids endure and even until this day. My name is William Fletcher. I've been a friend of Josh's for about a couple years now. I was already helping Josh with pickups and drop-offs, but I didn't become a supervisor until August, officially. I was supposed to supervise pickups and drop-offs, so I'd have to be there present and witness Caleb coming up to him and being in the vehicle, being at home with him if needed. Pretty much any time Caleb was around and Josh didn't have somebody else around, I'd have to be there. After a while of doing it, I kind of wondered what the point was because I haven't really seen or heard anything bad at all. So I'm not sure why I'm uh, still having to do that, but Caleb was not excited to leave his father. That's what I noticed a few times. He would say it, he would lock himself in the vehicle Josh would go over to his side of the door and try and open it, and Caleb would lock it again. They would have their back and forth of Josh trying to convince him he's got to go. I mean, it stressed out Josh an awful lot, as I think it did Caleb too, just from what I've seen. We pull over before, and I've let him vent, you know, explain, kind of let him 
go through the motions of what he's feeling and that and let him talk to me about it this way. When he's with Caleb, he's not experiencing it and trying to balance all that all together. But I, I definitely know it stresses him out a lot. Not only just trying to be a father to Caleb and trying to be there for him for whatever Caleb is going through, but also with those allegations against you, especially when you're not guilty of it, like that weighs on a, that would definitely weigh on a person. I know it really does weigh on him a lot. It definitely makes me wonder whether this is something I would want. Um, I wouldn't want to get in a situation like that. Uh, so, I mean, it, it definitely brings up those questions. As far as how it makes me feel, I mean, financially it's ruining them. Physically, you know, being stressed, wondering how you're going to afford a lawyer, how you're going to afford a car payment when you have all this going on. I've heard him say that he gets punished if he tries to hug Josh. I've heard that once, I believe. We were in the vehicle and I can't remember how the conversation started, but it just resulted in Caleb saying that he will get punished if he tries to hug Josh. Um, he gets his electronics taken away. That was one that I do remember. I don't see why another parent would do that. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I think that wanting to hug your other parent is pretty normal. So I don't see why that would be a punishment. So I would think that when growing up, they would probably develop probably poor coping mechanisms. I'd hate to see that for them. You know, I, I really think they deserve to be in Josh's care full time, at least for a while anyway, until these issues get resolved. I've been involved with Josh's life for a while. I was good friends with his ex. So I kind of saw both sides of it and was in the thick of it, I guess. She would tell me one thing and I would give the message because she wanted someone who was kind of neutral in it. And even then I would see her do a 360 and it all of a sudden I'm the bad guy. It's kind of how it all came to ends with her. Even at the beginning with her stating like she didn't want the kids around me or around my children because of how I raise them or do things. And just from Caleb and Brianna being, well, I want them to, or I want to be here. They're my friends and why can't I? And it got to the point where she would just be dictating their lives so they couldn't be the children that they should have been. But I do believe that, yes, the children were mistreated in more ways than one. I do think that things need to change. They need to be more involved, not just say like a weekly or monthly check-in or over the phone. They need to prioritize solely just the kids, not just going in and checking for the houses or we've seen this or this, but to actually sit down, be involved and spend an hour or two every week just getting to know the situation and the people before any assessment could actually be made. My experience, it's me who's been steamrolled and just fighting to get my voice heard over a dominant male is difficult and I feel she had gone in on this on the total defense even though it was her who played the first card and if people actually learn to communicate that it all could have just been avoided. I believe that all separations or divorces need to start as a no fault. So each person has a say at the beginning to state their case, who they are, and no one is prioritized over the other. I believe taking everyone's statement with a grain of salt until you've got supporting documentation which is why I kind of believe that every case should go in on a separation or divorce as a no fault because you can then prove this is who I am and no, that is a lie because as I've already proven, that's not who I am or something I would do. And 
going in on the opposite of that and uh, someone is prioritized over the other, they're going to be blinded to those facts and those things and they can be steamrolled over. I think it's important to remember that in a divorce or separation, even though you hate each other now, you didn't at the beginning. And those qualities, they didn't just go away. Like I get people change and everything. But you once were with this person because you loved them or you wanted them. And if there's children involved, it is important that it isn't only one-sided. Even if the one person has completely wronged you, they still deserve to be part of the children's lives and it's up to the children to make their own judgment on the parental figure or guardian. And it's not up to the adult to tell them how to decide or how they need to live. I was a police officer in BC for 20 years, and in that time I have dealt with hundreds of family court cases. I have personally and professionally witnessed how skewed the justice system can be toward women. In my experienced opinion, the court system is still stuck in the past when the mother was traditionally the main child caregiver. That is simply no longer the case. With lots of single fathers out there as well as same-sex marriages, to think that the mother is the only caregiver and to continually side with her is an archaic way of thinking. When it comes to these situations, each one needs to be examined for the totality of the circumstances. Let the facts speak for themselves and then decide who is currently in the best position to be the primary caregiver. It shouldn't just be a given that the best caregiver is automatically the mother. With all the movements that are currently in the headlines, men are becoming more and more afraid of standing up for themselves. Now don't get me wrong, there are some horrible men out there that have done some despicable things. However, we need not to jump to conclusions and condemn based on gender and examine each case on its own merits. Removing all biases. Not an easy task, to say the least. Courts are afraid to go after people making false accusations. They say if we prosecute those that are lying, we will scare away people with legitimate complaints for fear of prosecution. I say that the justice system should be there to protect those who cannot protect themselves. If you knowingly make a false report, then you should be punished for that. In a lot of cases, the actual accusation of the crime is worse than a conviction ever would be. The accusation sticks with you forever, regardless if you are exonerated or not. From personal experience, I know how frustrating navigating the court system can be. Advocacy groups for men are few and far between. Then you add in the stigma that it is weak to seek assistance, and a lot of men suffer through their tribulations alone. This needs to change. This is the first step talking about it.